So, uh, yes, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim Button. I'm from the University of Cambridge, and I was delighted when this conference was organised because I've been thinking about the model theoretic arguments for quite some time. I suspect, given the nature of the Munich Institute, I was invited here because of a very technical paper that I wrote. Um, and I'm not going to talk about anything even remotely technical today. So that might be a good thing, given that this is quite early in the morning, or you might be disappointed, given your love of uh, logical mathematical methods in philosophy. Um, what I intend to do is discuss... Uh, essentially a bridge that is often overlooked in the sort of folk reception of Putnam's model theoretic arguments. So on the one hand, Putnam advanced the model theoretic arguments, uh, first publicly around um, 1976, and then a little less than two decades later, he was telling us that what we need to do in response to them is to change our philosophy of perception. And people tend to focus on either discussing the model theoretics arguments themselves and not discussing why Putnam ended up saying what he did about philosophy of perception, or discussing what he said about philosophy of perception and not looking at how the model theoretic arguments led him to say that. So what I'd like to do is kind of build a bridge between those two things and explain why Putnam's thinking about the model theoretic arguments led him to make certain claims about philosophy of perception, and also in the end to say why those claims uh, were not, in fact, mandated by the model theoretic arguments, but why you might see them as being. So, in a way, my talk is summed up in an attempt to address why Putnam said the following thing. So, this is a quote from his Dewey lectures, Sense, Nonsense, and the Senses, repeated in the threefold chord. And he says, The how does language hook onto the world issue is, at bottom, a replay of the old how does perception hook onto the world issue. Is it any wonder that one cannot see how thought and language hook onto the world if one never mentions perception? So here he's telling us, you know, somehow if you just sort out your philosophy of perception, if you get that in order, then the model theoretic arguments will never arise as problematic. And I want to know why he said that. And my, uh, oh, yes, one thing I should say as well, uh, this is partly just an excuse for me to do some product placement. Um, so this is a bit too ambitious as regards a talk. Uh, what I'm going to try to do today is give you a whistle-stop tour through about the first third of a book that I have coming out at the beginning of June, which is on uh, realism and anti-realism, and one of the main themes of it is the model theoretic argument. So basically, I'm summarizing a general thing that I've argued for, but if you want any of the fine-grained details, you're probably going to have to go away and read the book, or you know, if you're not looking at this on the web, you can ask me questions afterwards. Okay, so the, strat uh, the overarching strategy is I'm going to start off by explaining what the target of the model theoretic arguments is, how I think they're meant to work, the received dialectic concerning the just more theory manoeuvre, and why I think that's inadequate. And then in the second section of the talk, I'm going to explain why I think the just more theory manoeuvre is actually really good, and so the model theoretic arguments do pose a serious problem for a certain kind of person. And I'm going to build on that in section three, and once we've seen why they pose a problem for a certain kind of person, we'll see why Putnam was tempted to move towards direct realism about perception uh, to a position that he described as natural realism. So we'll see why he made that move, but also why, in the end, it's inadequate. Okay, so because I'm starting off the, uh, the workshop, I don't mind going through some of the things that you may find a little bit boring or uh, massively covered in the three decades of literature on this. Um, but the target of the model theoretic arguments is a position that goes by various names. Sometimes Putnam calls it metaphysical realism. Um, he's recently suggested that that's not such a great name because the model theoretic arguments aren't meant to show that you can't do metaphysics at all. So you might call it capital R realism. He does that at various stages, but that's a bad name because if you start off a sentence with the beginning with that as the beginning, then uh, you don't know whether you're talking about realism with a lowercase r or realism with a capital R. And if you translate it into German, you've absolutely no idea. My favourite term for this is to call it external realism, because it conjures to mind the right kind of image, which is that of reasoning from an external God's eye point of view. And that's the kind of image that is operating in the background of the philosophical position, which is going to be attacked by the model theoretic arguments. But pictures, philosophical images, are very difficult to attack. So what we need is some kind of principles that you might subscribe to as a result of adopting this picture, and then we can attack the principles. And Putnam suggests three principles, and I'm just going to summarise them for you. The first is a kind of commitment to independence. So this is the claim that the majority of objects are mostly independent of minds, languages, and theories. Now, of course, I have to say mostly there, because, of course, there are plenty of objects that are mind-dependent and language-dependent and theory-dependent, such as minds themselves and languages themselves and theories themselves. But most of the universe, according to the external realist, gets on just perfectly well without us doing very much. That's the general spirit of the independence principle. And it's certainly a necessary condition 
of being a realist of any sort that you accept something like this. Whether it's also a sufficient condition is controversial, and I'm not going to discuss that. For now, I'm just going to characterize a particular position called external realism, which not only subscribes to the independence principle, but also subscribes to some other things too. And the second thing that they subscribe to is a theory of truth. If you've got all of these objects which are independent of our minds, languages, and theories, then we need to know how we're able to think, speak, and theorize about them. And the external realist answers this by invoking a correspondence principle, the claim that truth involves some kind of correspondence between words on the one hand and objects on the other. And this is kind of quintessentially the realist theory of truth. So if truth consists in correspondence, then presumably falsity consists in failure of correspondence. And here we have something of a problem arising. Suppose that you've been given some kind of theory which is brilliant to work with in various ways. It might be simple, it might be... Uh, very good at predicting all of your experience and retrodicting them as well. It might give you a certain kind of happy glow when you work with it. You feel very happy to use this theory in a variety of ways. Such a theory would be canonically ideal. But if the objects in the world that you're trying to describe really are that independent of your theories, then you might wonder, for all of that, for all that this theory is ideal, can I be sure that it's actually right? Mightn't it be the case that appearances are massively deceptive, and in fact, unbeknownst to me, things are going very wrong indeed? And this kind of sceptical anxiety is enshrined by the external realist in a principle I call the Cartesianism principle, which is the claim that even an entirely ideal theory might be hopelessly, radically false. So the external realist is likely to entertain certain kinds of canonical sceptical worries, like maybe I'm being deceived by an evil genius, or maybe I'm a handless brain in a vat, or maybe the universe sprang into existence only five minutes ago with all of this evidence around me to deceive me into thinking it had been here for 12 billion years, or whatever. Okay, so those are the three principles that the external realist subscribes to. Um, I've introduced external realism as something like a term of art, but I think it's fairly obvious that these three principles have some currency, so I'm not just attacking a straw man, and Putnam wasn't just attacking a straw man. The question is how exactly we can attack these, and Putnam suggests that we use a little bit of model theory. Um, I think one of the things in the rubric for this workshop was to explain exactly which bits of model theory are required for the model theoretic arguments. So here's the answer. We need two results, the permutation theorem and some kind of completeness theorem. The permutation theorem is just the claim that if you've got a structure and then you shuffle around all the objects in the structure but you leave the labels where they were, then you get a new structure which makes true exactly the same sentences as the old one and false exactly the same sentences as the old one. I say that's a theorem that might be dignifying it with a bit too much of an honorific. I mean, it requires almost no mathematics to prove it, and moreover, it's almost an adequacy condition on a semantic theory that it should have some kind of permutation theorem. So you might almost take it as an axiom of being an adequate way of doing any kind of semantics. Completeness theorems are a little bit you know, more sophisticated than that, but they're still hardly very highbrow. And we have, you know, uh, Simpson has told us that the completeness theorem for first order logic reverses to RCA0 or WKL0, depending upon uh, exactly what you want to do with it. So, Basically, almost no mathematics is required. And in fact, it's not even clear to me that you need any model theory to get the model theoretic arguments going. I'll uh, maybe come back to that a little bit later. But once you have these two theorems floating around, we can present two families of model theoretic arguments, which Putnam tends to run together, but I think it's worth separating out. And the two families are as follows. First, there are arguments which I'll call indeterminacy arguments. And I call them this because they have something to do with Quine's arguments for the indeterminacy of translation. And Putnam says as much himself. And these arguments are trying to get at the following claim. If there's any way to make a theory true, then there are bound to be many ways of making that theory true. This is an immediate consequence of the permutation theorem. It's also a consequence of the completeness theorem. If you've got a model for a thing, it's also going to have a model in the natural numbers, and probably that wasn't the model that you originally wanted to work with. So you can get indeterminacy arguments using either of the two theorems I've just mentioned. There's also infallibilism arguments. And this is, um, we're trying to get to the conclusion that even uh, every ideal theory can be made true. So the way this argument works is you take a theory and you know that it's ideal. Well, in that case, it must be consistent because if it were inconsistent, we could derive the contradiction and then we could prove anything and so it would clearly be not an ideal theory if you could prove everything. Parche, Graham Priest, and worries about the fact that explosion mightn't be a valid principle, but I'm just going to bracket all, all concerns about power consistency for today. So the completeness theorem tells us that Every ideal theory has a model, i.e. every ideal theory can be made true. And these two arguments, in the first instance, at least target the correspondence principle and the Cartesianism principle, respectively. 
The indeterminacy argument gives you an embarrassment of riches, too many correspondence relations, as it were. And infallibilism arguments make the external realist worry, because when she says even an ideal theory might be radically, hopelessly false, we say, well, there's bound to be some way to make it true, so why doesn't that way suffice to make the theory true? And the general challenge that these two different families of arguments present is the external realist needs to say something about what pins down the relationship between words and world, what fixes correspondence, reference, interpretation. Okay. So at this point, we enter into a very familiar dialectic, which runs something like the following. It seems like Putnam is saying nothing could possibly pin down the relationship between words and world. And the external realist says, well, plenty of things might. Perhaps causation helps to pin down reference and correspondence. And Putnam, notoriously at this stage, wheels out his just more theory maneuver and says, OK, I hear you telling me the phrase causation fixes reference. I presume you want that to be part of your ideal theory, because if you don't want it to be part of your ideal theory, we should reject it on other grounds. It's not ideal, so dismiss it. But if it is part of your ideal theory, then the arguments that I presented on the previous slide apply, because they apply to absolutely any ideal theory whatsoever. So we can reinterpret your phrase, causation fixes reference, with impunity. We can make causation refer to something else, make fixes refer to something else if we like. I don't know exactly which bits, how exactly we're going to decompose this into a first order sentence. But whatever you want to do, we can reinterpret it so you fail to pin down reference and correspondence after all. And at this point, the external realist gets very angry and says, I didn't tell you that the phrase causation fixes reference fixes reference. I told you that causation fixes reference. And you haven't talked about causation. You've talked about some words. So you fail to pay any attention to what I just said. Moreover, if I'm right and causation does in fact fix reference, then your reinterpretation of my phrase, causation fixes reference, will ex hypothesis be a misinterpretation. So you've assumed precisely what you set out to prove, namely that nothing fixes reference and correspondence. And a bunch of people have made that kind of objection. Um, there's Devitt quite early on, uh, Tim Bayes has made it as well, and the general consensus I'd suggest is that most philosophers think, yeah, Putnam hopelessly begs the question with his just more theory manoeuvre, and that's an end to the matter. That's when most people, I think, set down the model theoretic arguments and walk away from them. Nice try at settling all of the anti-realism realism debate with a little bit of model theory, but hey, turns out it didn't work. And I think that's unfortunate for a number of reasons, but not least of which is that this is the point at which the model theoretic arguments actually get interesting, for me at least. This is the point at which they become uh, something worthy of philosophical discussion rather than a trite technical observation. So I want to convince you in the end that the just more theory manoeuvre is actually good when directed against the external realist. Um, but in order to do that, I want to raise an interpretative problem which has been highlighted by a few people. It was a puzzle that puzzled Lewis. It puzzles Hale and Wright in their, um, their survey paper on the model theoretic arguments. And it's something Eagle Duven has picked up on. So here's the interpretative puzzle. If the just more theory manoeuvre works, it's a completely general manoeuvre. It didn't depend upon anything about causation. It just, whatever the external realist said, I could reinterpret what they were saying. Right? That was the whole reason the external realist objected, because it was so completely massively general. And its generality is in some ways a good thing for Putnam, because he wants to show that the entire picture of external realism is wrong, rather than showing that the causal theory of reference is wrong, or some fine-grained detail. So if it works, it's wholly general. No matter what the external realist says to try to fix reference and correspondence, we can run the just more theory manoeuvre against it. And now here's the interpretative puzzle. Putnam allows the external realist to appeal to magic in an attempt to fix reference. He says, look, you can't appeal to causation and you can't appeal to a whole bunch of other things, but you could appeal to spooky reference-fixing relations, to noumenal rays, and he has about 16 different pejorative rhetorical phrases which he uses, all of which are to say, you can fix reference by appealing to magic, you're not allowed to in any other way. But the interpretative puzzle is very simple. If the just more theory manoeuvre works, it ought to work for the claim magic fixes reference just as much as it works for the claim causation fixes reference. So why is magic an exception? That's the puzzle. Um, and I think there's a fairly straightforward answer to it. But the initial answer to it is that we should regard the just more theory manoeuvre not in the way I just presented on the previous slide exactly, but as posing us with a dilemma. Here's the two horns of the dilemma. On the one hand, either the external realist attempt to fix reference has empirical content, which is a good thing, but unfortunately that does mean that it's just more theory, and so it fails to fix reference. And the other horn of the dilemma is, the external realist attempt to fix reference has no empirical content, and in that case, it might manage to fix reference, 
But because it lacks empirical content, she might as well have told us that magic fixes reference as told us that causation fixes reference, because she's just spouting kind of hopeless metaphysical nonsensey magic y stuff. So that's how the just more theory maneuver should be understood instead. Now, I don't yet claim to have vindicated the just more theory maneuver. All I want to do on this slide is free up space for you to think about the just more theory maneuver a little differently so you can see that there might be something less than hopelessly question begging going on with it. And what I want to do in the next section of the talk is convince you that this dilemma does in fact apply against the external realist. So I should just caveat that importantly. It doesn't apply completely generally. Putnam was never trying to argue that reference is hopelessly underdetermined. He was always directing it as a reductio against a particular position, the external realist. So this is just an ad hominem against the external realist, and it's to show that this dilemma does apply to the external realist, not that it applies completely generally. Okay, so with all of that caveating in mind, here's my attempt to convince you that the just more theory maneuver does indeed tell against the external realist. And what I need to do in order to convince you of that is talk to you a little bit about what empirical content means, because the dilemma has to do with whether or not the phrase causation fixes reference has empirical content. And I haven't yet said anything about what empirical content amounts to. So our clue as to what empirical content might amount to comes from Putnam's more detailed discussions of what it means to call a theory ideal. So at the start of this talk, I gave you a sort of hand-waving gesture about what it might mean to call a theory ideal, but now I need to say a little bit more about it. And in a more recent paper, um, Putnam gives us a bit of help. He says, an ideal theory is one which violates no operational constraint and no theoretical constraint. So if we know what theoretical and operational constraints are, then we'll be able to know what an ideal theory is. And actually, the vocabulary of operational and theoretical constraints is something that Putnam's used since models and reality. But it is quite idiosyncratic vocabulary. Other people don't use it, so we do need to work out what it might mean. A theoretical constraint is basically what people in the philosophy of science typically refer to as a super-empirical virtue. It's maxims like, you should favor simple theories over complex ones. You should favor computationally tractable theories over computationally intractable ones. You should favor deterministic theories over indeterministic ones. And these desiderata might compete with one another. So it might be that the most computationally tractable theory is actually a probabilistic one uh, rather than a deterministic one. But insofar as they are just super-empirical virtues, they seem to tell largely at the formal level of what's going on with regard to theories. They're things that we can determine just basically by looking at the syntax of the theory. And so as far as the model theoretic arguments are concerned, they're not going to matter very much because the bits of model theory that we appeal to apply to any theory whatsoever, be it simple or complex, computationally tractable or computationally intractable. So we can kind of forget about them for current purposes. Operational constraints are a little bit trickier to deal with. And operational constraints concern what other people in the philosophy of science would call the empirical content of a theory. So Putnam tells us that to meet operational constraints is to imply predictions which seem to be true, i.e., broadly speaking, it's to be empirically adequate. And now a little subtlety emerges, because when I presented the model theoretic arguments to you in the first section of this talk, I was thinking of theories as totally uninterpreted strings of symbols, perhaps written down on a page in some canonical notation system. And totally uninterpreted symbols cannot imply predictions which seem to be true because they're totally uninterpreted. All they are is bits of ink on a page. And you can do various deductions, manipulating them in various ways, but you can't imply predictions which seem to be true. So the very idea of meeting operational constraints, the very idea of a theory's being empirically adequate, presupposes that we have some kind of relation set up between words, the formal symbols of our theory on the one hand, and our experiences on the other. And then the idea is that meeting operational constraints is basically getting everything right at the level of experiences. But that means that we have at least partially interpreted the theory because we've set up a relationship between words and experiences. We're no longer thinking of these theories as totally uninterpreted symbol systems. And with that in mind, we need to revisit exactly how the model theoretic arguments work. So let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that we construe experience in a very wide sense, in the way that people who are called direct realists in the philosophy of perception construe experience. So for example, they think that when I have an experience as of seeing a cat, and when indeed I do have that experience, because they think of seeing as a success term, that that experience involves the very cat that I see, perhaps the cat Ajax. And then I might have another experience as of seeing a cat. It might be qualitatively indiscernible. I might not be able to tell the difference between the two experiences. 
But if experiences actually involve the cats themselves, and this is an experience of a different cat, even though I can't tell because they look very similar, then it is, properly speaking, a different experience. So I look at one cat, it's Ajax, I have one experience. I look at another cat, I don't realize that I'm looking at another cat. It seems exactly the same, but because it's another cat, it's a totally different experience. That's what a direct realist in the philosophy of perception will tell you. If you think of experience in that way, then the canonical statement of the model theoretic arguments misfires. And the reason it misfires is quite simple. Experiences are now set up in such a way that when I'm linking up words to experiences, I link them to particular specific objects. So if I now shuffle all of the objects around via a permutation argument, I will get things wrong at the level of experience. And so when I give you a reinterpretation via permutation, say, I will not have given you something which is any longer an ideal theory. It will get your experiences wrong when you think about experiences in this very wide, rich sense. So, if we end up appealing to a very wide notion of experience, we can't run the model theoretic arguments. And Putnam was aware of this at the time that he presented the model theoretic arguments. He attempted to force a narrow conception of experience onto the external realist. Um, yeah, sorry, I've just said that. I'm not going to talk on about any of the details about how he tries to force it upon them, but there's a number of passages that you might go to to see that this happens. One of them is in Reason, Truth, and History on page 28. He discusses Husserl, and he talks about the notion of bracketing. And another one is in the Introduction to Realism and Reason, the collected um, papers, where he talks about um, uh, restricting ourselves to solipsistic description. And what he doesn't say explicitly there, but what is very obviously implicit, is this is an oblique reference to the methodological solipsism that you get in uh, section 64 of Carnap's Aufbau, where Carnap also invokes Husserl and also uses a scare-quoted notion of solipsism and tells you to think about experience in a very narrow sense, forgetting about everything which is going on behind it, just thinking about experience as it is given uh, in experience. Um, so there's some oblique references to, to Carnap that um, if you start to tease out, you, you start to appreciate much more what's going on with the model theoretic arguments. But I'm going to skip over them. You'll have to look at my book for the details. And instead just say, we can genuinely foist this narrow conception of experience onto the external realist. And the way that we can do this is basically because they invoked a Cartesianism principle. They described uh, the Cartesianism principle because they were worried that you might be right with respect to appearances, but wrong with respect to what was actually happening in the world. And this essentially sets up what you might think of as a veil of sensations. We sit one side of the veil of sensations, and when we theorize, we manage to regulate all of that stuff wonderfully, perhaps, with regard to what's going on at the level of your sensations. But who knows what's going on on the other side of it? It's this totally inaccessible world screened off by the veil of sensations. That's essentially the thing enshrined in the Cartesianism principle. And that is essentially a bracketed, narrow conception of experience. It's just things at the level of the veil of sensations and not thinking about the experience as going beyond that. So crudely, the external realist is thinking of the empirical content of a theory in terms of getting everything right at the level of sensations, i.e. getting all of your bracketed experiences correct. And they think about truth and falsity in terms of corresponding to what happens behind the veil of sensations. And that's sufficient for them, firstly, to not be able to appeal to the move made on the previous slide. Um, they can't you know, say that the experience directly involves the object itself. And it's also sufficient for us to run a version of the model theoretic arguments against them. And we can do this in various ways, but the simplest way is just to restate the permutation theorem and the completeness theorem, having taken into account the fact that maybe they've believed in certain very special objects called sensations, which they have immediate access to. So we're going to offer a permutation theorem behind the veil of sensations and a completeness theorem behind the veil of sensations. To do permutation behind the veil is very easy. You start off with a domain of objects, some of which are sensations, some of which are ordinary objects that sit behind the veil of sensations. The external realist claims that she is in direct contact with her sensations, but she worries about her contact with the ordinary objects. So now you just shuffle around the ordinary objects and you leave the sensations in place. And then you'll get everything right at the level of experience. You'll preserve all the empirical content in the way we're now thinking of it, but you'll have got all of the reference relations to ordinary objects wrong. So it's very easy to do a permutation. In this case, you just hold some objects fixed and shuffle around others. And that's an observation that Putnam made in the appendix of Reason, Truth, and History. Here's a way of doing completeness behind the veil of sensations. So suppose the external realist knows that she's got everything right at the level of sensations, and then maybe she wonders about whether or not there's even an external world behind it at all. 
Well, what we know is that if a theory is ideal, then there's bound to be a model in the natural numbers, and some of the objects that are being picked out by the terms in your language are going to be falling under your predicate is a sensation, and some of them are going to fall under the predicate is an ordinary object that sits behind the veil of sensations. So we can partition the object, uh, we can partition the model up into think numbers which are doing the sensation -y work and numbers which are doing the work of ordinary objects, and then we just shuffle in the actual sensations in place of the natural numbers, and now we've got a completeness theorem, which is what we wanted. And that is quite close to something that Put uh, Putnam says in Models and Reality, but it's also picking up on something that Carnap says way back in 1956, so there's even more connections to be drawn between Putnam at this time and Carnap. Okay, but the general point is we can still use the two theorems that we needed to get the model theoretic arguments going, even in this special context where people are talking about empirical content in terms of adequacy to sensations, and so we can still get everything running as before. So we can still offer deviant interpretations, and we can still raise the same challenge. So now the external realist comes along and says, okay, Putnam, yep, you've given me these deviant interpretations of uh, my theory, and now I want to tell you, as I did before, way back at the end of section one of this talk, that causation fixes reference. And at this point, Putnam offers the just more theory manoeuvre, and he deploys a phrase that he uses in the introduction to realism and reason, and says, if you object to my just more theory manoeuvre now, you are ignoring your own epistemological position. And the reason he's now entitled to say this is the following. On the one hand, the external realist might think of causation as a theoretical posit that she's using in an attempt to navigate her way around sensations. So either it's just a useful bit of formalism or it's something that sits on this side of the veil of sensations. In which case it's fine, and I claim that causation fixes reference is full and rich with empirical content. But because it only concerns what's happening on this side of the veil of sensations, it couldn't possibly fix reference. It can't possibly burst through the veil of sensations to the other side. So it is just more theory. And if we want more precedence with Carnap, we can just think about the way that Carnap himself describes something like a theory of reference in the Aufbau, which is recognizably like Evans's causal theory of reference. But Carnap doesn't think that this enables you to break outside of the constructional system to the world behind. That would be nonsense, according to Carnap. Rather, it just is a further way to navigate your way around the, uh, the auto-psychological basis, the given. So there's something similar happening here. If the external realist thinks about causation as something with empirical content, then all it allows you to do is navigate your way around your experiences, and it is just more theory and cannot fix reference to the world behind your experiences. Or, alternatively, maybe causation is meant to help you puncture through that veil of sensations and get at what is going on behind. But in that case, it bridges beyond the veil of sensations, and so it is something that cannot possibly have any empirical content, because empirical content is exhaustively accounted for by what is happening at the level of your sensations. So if causation is meant to fix reference to the world behind, you might as well have said magic fixes reference, as said that causation fixes reference for all the empirical content the claim would have had. And this, recall, was just the dilemma that I was trying to establish concerning the just more theory maneuver. If you succeed in fixing reference, you are without empirical content. So the just more theory maneuver, in the form I understand it, is vindicated against the external realist. Now, I've gone through things a bit too fast there. There are a bunch of moves that the external realist can make, being a bit more subtle about what she means by sensations. But fundamentally, nothing changes. Uh, no matter how much subtlety she introduces, this is the basis of a problem. Just take it on trust. There's no need to ask questions about that. <laughs> so what do we do now? What's the moral of the story? Well, we're going to have to find... Uh, oh, no, actually, no, not yet to the moral of the story. There's a move the external realist can make, which is not just bells and whistles on the notion of sensations. And it is, maybe she can just be nonchalant about this. Maybe she can just accept everything I said. So I'm going to explain in this section why she can't do that and for this slide, at least, I'm going to talk in the voice of the external realist. So here's, here's my impression of an external realist now. OK, look, Putnam, or, or Tim, depending on who, who she's addressing, you've raised several semantic sceptical scenarios. You've raised scenarios in which the word cat refers to cherries. You've raised scenarios in which all the theories that I thought were true turn out to be false, and all the ones that I thought were false turn out to be true. You've presumably raised scenarios in which nothing refers to anything at all. These are all sceptical scenarios with regard to reference and correspondence. I understand that. Now, also, you've convinced me that these semantic sceptical worries lack empirical content, um, because whether or not the reference relation obtains to the world behind the veil of sensations makes no difference to how things are at the level of sensations. 
So your skeptical worries are themselves without empirical content. The skeptical hypothesis and the non-skeptical hypothesis are empirically indistinguishable. And this is something I, as an external realist, am wholly used to. You know, when I explained my position, I committed myself to the Cartesianism principle. And there I accepted that there are a bunch of skeptical scenarios which have no empirical content. So, for example, I worry that I'm a handless brain in a vat. And the skeptical scenario there is deliberately empirically indistinguishable from the scenario in which everything is indeed as it seems and I've got hands and I'm not in a vat and I'm addressing you all. So I'm used to having skeptical scenarios that lack empirical content. So all you have taught me in the first half of this talk is the following. There are these unanswerable skeptical worries that now concern semantics rather than more traditional skeptical worries. And yeah, I should add those to my list of unanswerable skeptical worries that I'm worried about. But, you know, that is the lot of an external realist, to have anxieties about unanswerable skeptical hypotheses. So thanks for telling me that I need to worry about more than I realize. But this isn't going to make me give up my possession. It's just going to make me even more angsty or something like that. OK, so that's, that's the end of my impression of an external realist. Um, and this sets up a challenge for us. The challenge is, why is semantics a special case? Now, Putnam tends not to address that question. And the one person I know of who does address it very specifically is Igor Duvan. Um, I have some things to say about his argument for thinking that semantics uh, should be a special case, but I'm not going to do that here. Uh, instead, I'm going to offer my reasons for thinking that semantics should be a special case, and so why the external realist can't make this nonchalant response. And the reason is, broadly speaking, that there are relevantly different ways of being a skeptic, and we should disentangle them. And here I'm following a, a lovely paper by Conant um, called, I think it's Varieties of Skepticism, which is a 2004 paper. So Conant distinguishes, it's an old distinction, but he distinguishes between Cartesian skepticism on the one hand and Kantian skepticism on the other. Um, and he, he phrases the difference very nicely, so I'm just going to offer you a few quotes from Conant. Um, Cartesian skepticism paradigmatically asks, how can I know that things are as they seem? I have all these appearances and the world seems to be a certain way, but how can I know that things are that way? Maybe I'm deceived by an evil genius. Kantian skepticism asks, how can things so much as seem to be a certain way? Deeper, weirder question. Cartesian skepticism asks, which thoughts are true? Which experiences are veridical? And Kantian skepticism asks, what does it take to have thoughts that are vulnerable to how things are? So there's a sense in which Kantian skepticism is prior to, deeper than Cartesian skepticism. Cartesian skepticism takes it for granted that your beliefs have content, that they are either true or false. And the question is, how do you know that they're true or false? What evidence could you have? Kantian skepticism says, how can I even be sure that my beliefs are about the world at all? How do they even get content? How do they hook up to the world? And these are two very different forms of skepticism, at least prima facie. I think there are some important links between them. What the external realist commits to in her Cartesianism principle is taking Cartesian skeptical problems seriously. She has Cartesian angst. What she hadn't yet committed to was taking Kantian skeptical problems seriously, to having Kantian angst. And the model theoretic arguments precisely raise issues to do with Kantian angst. They ask you, how is reference so much as possible? How is it so much as possible that I am able to have thoughts that are about the world? And in a way, if you're starting to worry about that, you know, good luck even wondering, you know, how can I know whether they're true or false? You first need to wonder, what does it even take for your beliefs to be true or false? Okay, so the semantic skeptical scenarios indeed express Kantian angst, they raise thoughts like, maybe nothing refers as it should. Maybe everything that I think is true is false and vice versa. Maybe, maybe nothing refers to anything. Maybe all of my beliefs just fail to make any contact with the world. These are paradigmatically Kantian worries rather than Cartesian worries. And the difference between Cartesian and Kantian skepticism is very simple. Kantian skepticism is utterly incoherent. It's not even entertainable in thought. And if Cartesian skepticism isn't entertainable in thought, that's because of a subtle relationship with Kantian skepticism. So in order to try to convince you of that, let's focus on a particular skeptical scenario that Putnam made famous with the permutation arguments. And the scenario is as follows, that the word cats does not refer to cats, but instead refers to cherries. And presumably that that's going to happen with all your words. They all end up referring to the wrong things, as it were. <laughs> 
So this is the scenario we're meant to be worrying about in the same way that I'm meant to worry about being a handless brain in a vat or something like that. But how do we try to worry about this? Well, you might try to worry about it by, as I have done, writing up a phrase on a, on a slide. So you might write the phrase, the word cats does not refer to cats. But if you think about it for a moment, that's not an adequate way of expressing the worry. Because if the sceptical scenario actually obtains, then the last word in the sentence that I've written down fails to pick out cats. So how do I entertain the worry? If I've managed to express the worry, then the scenario doesn't obtain. And if the scenario does obtain, I seem to have absolutely no way of expressing it. It's unthinkable. It's deeply incoherent in a profound way. More generally, the worry that absolutely no thought makes contact with the world, that absolutely nothing refers to anything at all, well, then in that case, I'm not telling you anything. Everything that I've said is without content. I'm just making mere sounds. And that's not something that I, at least, can intelligibly entertain. So, Kantian angst, unlike Cartesian angst, is deeply incoherent because Kantian sceptical hypotheses are deeply incoherent. That's the difference. That's why you can't shrug your shoulders in response to these new sceptical worries. It's not just more of the same. It's a different kind of scepticism in principle that the external realist has been forced to entertain. And in particular, she's been forced to entertain something that she cannot in principle entertain. And that is essentially what's wrong with external realism. This is the reductio that Putnam was after. The external realist starts by seriously entertaining Cartesian scepticism. Then we offer the model theoretic arguments and the just more theory manoeuvre, and we back up the just more theory manoeuvre by pointing out that she entertains Cartesian scepticism, so she thinks about experiences narrowly. And because of that, we lead her to realise that she has to entertain Kantian scepticism and take that seriously. But that's incoherent, so external realism itself must also be incoherent. That's the reductio of external realism. That's why we have to abandon external realism. Okay, so that's why it's wrong. So what's the moral? Well, the moral is the model theoretic arguments and the just more theory manoeuvre together comprise a machine that takes in Cartesian angst and spits out at the end Kantian angst. And you mustn't have Kantian angst because that doesn't make any sense. So the model theoretic arguments and the just more theory manoeuvre tell you that you mustn't have Cartesian angst because otherwise you'll be led to, Kant uh, to Kantian angst. So here's the diagnosis. If you cure yourself of Cartesian angst, then you won't be sort of fed into the machine of the model theoretic arguments and the just more theory manoeuvre and spat out at the other end. Rid yourself of Cartesian angst, and then you won't need to entertain Kantian angst at all. That's the diagnosis. So we know what went wrong, and we know now what we need to do. Rid ourselves of Cartesian angst. And Putnam spends most of the 80s trying to rid himself of Cartesian angst in various ways. So he connects truth with justification, and that is precisely in order to try to block the worry that even an ideal theory might be hopelessly false. He tries various ways of doing this, but you know, with various levels of success and various levels of satisfaction. But the general point, before we go into any details of how to react, is that we have to reject external realism because we have to reject the Cartesianism principle because the Cartesianism principle is what has caused all the problems. Important observation on the side, there is no need to reject the independence principle or the correspondence principle. We can adhere to them as much as we like, and so long as we don't also entertain some kind of Kantian angst, we're not going to need to worry about the model theoretic arguments and the just more theory manoeuvre. We could advance a correspondence theory of truth, and then if someone tried to offer a just more theory manoeuvre against us, we say, that's hopelessly question begging. And then we can't be forced into uh, the dialectic of section two just because we have a wider notion of experience. And that is precisely what Putnam ends up advocating in the early to mid-1990s and onwards. That's why he moves towards natural realism, towards a direct theory of perception. So, in this section, I'm going to explain exactly how that move has went to work, why it is indeed as tempting as I've hopefully tried to make it seem during the course of my talk, and then just end by saying why, unfortunately, it's totally inadequate to deal with the model theoretic arguments. Okay, so, here's Putnam again in Sense, Nonsense, and the Senses. Um, and just before the quote that I brought up at the very beginning of the talk, he says, how can there be a problem about talking about, say, houses and trees when we see them all the time? And he says, if you were to reject this way of answering the model theoretic arguments as hopelessly naive, well, 
you know, what, what, would, what would have been going through your mind? Why would you think that this was hopelessly naive? This is just the right answer. We see houses, cats, trees, cherries, cups, jugs, kettles, mugs. That's how we're able to talk about them. So the idea is that somehow if you just set your philosophy of perception in order, then we'll be able to talk about things without much by way of problems. So the general thought is this. Cure yourself of Cartesian angst by going naive about perception, recognising that there isn't a sceptical problem about how we see houses and trees, and then you'll be freed from Kantian angst. Because if someone asks you, how is it so much as possible to refer to trees and houses and stuff, you say, well, they're given me in perception. There's no, there's no difficulty there. What are, you, what are you worried about? That's the general strategy here. Cure us of Cartesian angst, specifically by going naive about perception, free us from Kantian angst. Now, confusingly, whilst he's saying all of this, Putnam is drawing a lot by way of comparison with McDowell, particularly McDowell as of around mind and world. And McDowell does say some very similar things about talking about perceptual openness to you know, things being given to you in experience that are not you know, the given in the myth of the given sense, but are just the objects of the world around you. And Putnam thinks that he and McDowell are very much on the same page. And to an extent they are, but there's also a very important difference between them, which Conant highlights. And the important difference is this. Whereas Putnam crudely thinks that you need to cure, cure Cartesian angst, and then you'll be cured of Kantian angst, McDowell thinks that you need to cure yourself of Kantian angst, and then you'll be free of Cartesian angst. So if you read Mind and World, it's all about a Kantian problematic. He mentions Cartesian sceptical worries just in passing and as a throwaway kind of triviality that is going to be sorted out once the serious business of working out how the faculties of spontaneity and receptivity are sort of integrated and, and all of that. So they operate in very different directions. Putnam wants to cure Cartesian angst first. McDowell wants to cure Kantian angst first. And so Conant claims that in an important sense they talk past each other and that this has given rise to some confusions in the literature. And I kind of agree with Conant about that. But there is something that's worth pointing out here. Given the diagnosis that I offered you at the end of the previous section, Putnam's strategy is surely right. Putnam, uh, there's a phrase by Conant where he says, it seems as if Putnam thinks that um, all of the Kantian problems that have exercised us so much in contemporary philosophy will just be solved if we can cure the Cartesian problems. And yes, he does think that. And the reason he thinks that is precisely because that is the moral of the model theoretic arguments when properly thought through. So it's not as if Putnam just read McDowell and misunderstood. Putnam's having the right reaction to the model theoretic arguments at this stage. So the right reaction in broad detail, uh, the, the wrong reaction, I think, at the very fine-grained level of can you solve all this by appealing to a particular philosophy of perception. So that's what I now want to explain. So why is it that natural realists who accept a naive philosophy of perception think that they have rid themselves of Cartesian angst? Well, roughly, it's for the following reason. Roughly speaking, natural realists are disjunctivists about perception. So I gave you a little discussion about half an hour ago about how they think that if you have a subjectively indiscernible experience of two different cats, they are genuinely distinct experiences. Let me offer you another way in which um, direct realists about perception have a particular attitude about what experience comes to. So when I seem to see a cat, and here I might not actually successfully see a cat, I'm in crudely one of two subjectively indiscernible states. The first state is, yes, I'm genuinely seeing a cat. That's what you would call the good disjunct. Or the bad disjunct, I'm just hallucinating and there's no cat there at all. Those are genuinely distinct experiences. It's not clear even whether you want to call the hallucinating one an experience, but if it is an experience, it's a genuinely distinct experience from the successful disjunct. But they're subjectively indiscernible. That's a crude formulation of disjunctivism, and it will do for our purposes enough. Because once you're a disjunctivist, it seems like you're going to be able to reject the Cartesianism principle out of hand. An ideal theory, I said, is one which gets everything right at the level of experience, and getting things right at the level of experience now amounts to the following, that when it seems to me like I'm in the good disjunct, the good disjunct actually does obtain. So when it seems to me like I see a cat, in fact, I do see a cat. And so now, if someone says, even an ideal theory must be hope, might be hopelessly radically false, the answer is no, of, of course not. Because if it's genuinely ideal, then when I seem to see a cat, I'm genuinely seeing a cat. So I'm right about seeing cats. And if, I, if, I, if it seems to me that I'm seeing a table, and because it's ideal, that means that I'm actually seeing a table, then I'm going to be right about tables, broadly speaking. So according to the natural realist, who's a bit of a disjunctivist, an ideal theory is going to be true in many respects, 
So they reject the Cartesianism principle and the model theoretic arguments don't get to work. So that's why you might well think that you know, naive realism, sorting out your philosophy of perception, was going to solve all your problems. But unfortunately, it's a familiar fact from philosophy of perception that going disjunctivist about perception doesn't help at all with regard to sceptical worries. So really now I'm just going to point out something that uh, has been pointed out many times before, but particularly um, well, I think, by Crispin Wright in a couple of papers. The 2002 paper there is um, uh, Skeptic Simple and Subtle. Um, and the observation is that disjunctivism just doesn't help, and, and here's why not. The disjunctivist, in formulating her theory, expresses herself by saying, there's a good disjunct and there's a bad disjunct, but they're subjectively indiscernible. So she accepts a vocabulary of talking about subjectively indiscernible states. They're different states, properly speaking, but you can't tell the difference between them. So now let's formulate the following predicate for theories. A theory is subjectively ideal, if and only if, Whenever that theory says I have an experience, either I actually have that experience or some subjectively indiscernible bad disjunct obtains. And the disjunctivist can't object to this as a stipulative definition because she accepts all of the vocabulary that I've used in formulating it. And now Cartesian angst renews itself. Instead of saying even an ideal theory might be hopelessly radically false, I just raise the following sceptical worry. Even a subjectively ideal theory might be hopelessly radically false. And disjunctivism just doesn't have any materials for dealing with this expression of Cartesian angst. But now we could just rerun everything I did at the level of subjective ideality instead of the level of ideality, and we'd have exactly the same shape of arguments as before. So just to be clear, this is not to say that the naive realist, the natural realist, uh, Putnam has a bunch of different phrases for it, must accept this renewed Cartesian angst. It's just to say that philosophy of perception doesn't give you any way of avoiding it. So the general problem that I had at the end of section three was the model theoretic arguments with the just more theory maneuver take Cartesian angst and spit out Kantian angst. So we've got to find a way of avoiding Cartesian angst. We turn to natural realism in a, in a hope to avoid it, but it doesn't manage to do that. So hopefully there will be something that we can do in order to avoid Cartesian angst and so avoid the model theoretic arguments getting to work on us. Hopefully there is a way of not being an external realist. And maybe that way involves being a naive realist about perception. But if it does, that's for totally other reasons off in the philosophy of perception. Maybe that's the best possible philosophy of perception. I don't know. That's not really what I do. I'm not a philosopher of mind. I don't do philosophy of perception. My point is just, it is unfortunately a red herring when it comes to the model theoretic arguments. The problems are just a bit too general for that. Okay, so just to summarise then, hopefully now you, you've got some sense of why it is that Putnam might have been tempted towards natural realism, towards a direct theory of perception in response to the model theoretic arguments. It's because everything turns on this Cartesianism principle and on this distinction between two different kinds of scepticism, Cartesian scepticism and Kantian scepticism. But also, hopefully, you see why it just can't possibly by itself be sufficient to answer the model theoretic arguments. We're still in the same boat, in a way, as Putnam was in the early 80s, wondering how is it that we formulate a theory which doesn't succumb to Cartesian angst. Thanks very much.